This year, like many other high school students, we were asked to choose our classes according to what we thought our future college careers would be. This choice has had a significant weight on us because we were always asked to choose a side, either be a STEM student or a humanities student. And this pressure generated a lot of stress and we began to dislike this idea and wonder why does the separation even exist? It is undeniable that the second half of the 20th century was defined by technological advancements. So much so that scientific development has become synonymous with development itself. This shift represents one of the biggest changes in our culture, a division between two cultures. As 20th century scientist C.P. Snow once said, Western society has become divided into two cultures, a humanitarian one and a scientific one leading to major hindrance in solving the world's problems. This has compounded over time and led to a separation between all areas of knowledge. Yet we cannot separate ourselves from one aspect or the other because we would simply fail to exist. However, this is what we are constantly asked to do. And even though the world is currently striding towards science, science cannot forget about humanities because without humanities, we would have no society at all for, because we will not know how to relate to each other. This is why there's an irrelevance in the dichotomy between the human and natural sciences. Science has undoubtedly done a great service to mankind. Humans, as rational beings, are always incredibly curious to understand the world that we are placed in. However, we are never satisfied with this acquired knowledge and are always keen to understand the universe where we are. Nonetheless, the separation between the human and natural sciences has led to a disregard of humanitarian implications in scientific areas. And over time, this has devalued discoveries, ceased studies, and led to a variety of complications. The Haber-Bosch process created by Fritz Haber is what allows for the fusion between nitrogen and hydrogen in order to create ammonium. This solved many of the problems that the world was facing in the 20th century because this product creates nitrate fertilizer, which is what sustains large populations. For nearly all of the seven billion people on Earth, including you, Half of the nitrogen in your body comes from the Haber method. And even though this is single-handedly one of the most important discoveries in the food production, Haber was also responsible for supervising the German poison gas program in World War I. And with this method, he created mustard gas, which killed thousands of people. Nonetheless, Haber was still awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1918. And the complications surrounding this choice are still felt to this day. And this is why ethics should always be considered in science. Another great example of this is that of invasion of privacy. And the front runner is quite obviously all your personal digital assistants. As big technology becomes more present in our lives, so does the invasion of our privacy. Think about it. Your devices are always listening. And by just saying one word, I can turn all of them on. These AI assistants have been accused of storing audio recorded from your phones without your consent. And big corporations have actually responded to these claims, stating that they have, in fact, kept these recordings and stated that they will continue to do so. In a society where we do not separate between cultures, our privacy and our rights are respected. And it is incredibly important that we begin to consider the effect that humanitarian areas have on scientific areas in order for us to move on to a better, more ethical future. On the other hand, science has also had a major influence in humanities. And ever since the Industrial Revolution, science had placed the setting in which these humanities face themselves, such as political, cultural, social, and economical settings. One clear aspect of this is the relationship that us humans have with meat. And not a lot of people know this, but the major boom in the cattle and poultry industry was completely cultural. And we have developed an obsession with meat. Scientists are trying to find an alternative to meat, which is ethically sound. And Impossible Burgers, this is, this is the reasoning behind the Impossible Foods, where they use ethically sound products such as plant, oils, and coconut in order to replicate the taste of meat. In this case, there's an ethically sound product while still maintaining the culture with meat. This can also be seen in the new area of study called neuromarketing. Neuromarketing is defined as a new field of marketing which uses scientific technologies such as MRI scans to study the brain's responses to marketing stimuli. This is essential to modern commerce as knowing what makes a consumer pick one good over the other can be the entire reason for its success. The simplest yet most effective usage of this is that of color. Look at the slide above us. What do you see? 
Do these colors remind you of anything? Maybe even a brand? All of these colors are incredibly stimulating to our brains. And red has been specifically linked to sensations of hunger. So it is not a coincidence that many globally successful fast food chains all utilize this very color scheme. It is the fastest, most efficient way of attracting customers. However, the usage of scientific knowledge for marketing purposes is deeply unethical, as it leads for, to consumers actually choosing products that they do not necessarily want or are not necessarily good for them. And it is also a huge reason why we must consider scientific implications in the humanities. However, the problem is that the separation is still present. At a time when climate change is currently destroying our world, there's a need for that collaboration between both cultures. It is no longer for facts and statistics to save us. If it were so, scientists would have already solved climate change. We already know the steps we have to take, but how haven't we taken them? This is because science cannot predict human behavior. One of the greatest examples of the fusion between both cultures is Neri Oxman. She's a scientist and leader of the MIT Media Lab. And her work is constantly praised by humanitarian articles as well as scientific articles. Her work includes biodegradable plastics, immense structures with the power of silkworms, robots that create autonomously structures, as well as 3D printed glass. All of these examples show us the power that the unity of cultures has. They change our perspectives on the norm, and they teach us that we can, in fact, rejoice in this union to be creative and to innovate. As Professor Oxman said, I don't think as of fashion as fashion or biology as biology. This is the mentality we require, one where there is no need for the categorization of knowledge, but just for the existence of knowledge itself. Abolishing this allows us to fully tap into our creativity, to think outside of the box, and to generate ideas that truly defy expectations. For me, this is important because as a woman in STEM, I have always seen the importance that humanities has had in science. Science has become part of my identity. It has become my passion and my interests. And I have always wanted to highlight the importance of humanities and science. As for me, I have always been deeply interested in both cultures. And upon realizing that my favorite subjects were mathematics, literature, and philosophy, I was constantly asked what I planned to do with such varying interests. It pained me to be placed into one box or the other, and it is a reason why I wholeheartedly believe in the unity of cultures. As young women looking forward to our college careers, we believe that the solution to this dichotomy lies in education. An open-minded education with a focus on interdisciplinary units is necessary for all students to understand the importance that, un that the unity of cultures has on them. And this stops the disregard for one culture or the other in many different aspects. It is as Egyptian author Nawal al-Sadawi once said, to be creative means to connect. It's to abolish the gap between the body, the mind, and the soul, between science and art, and between fiction and nonfiction. So, how will you help close the gap? Thank you. Thank you.